Noah's Ark. Did you know that there are dozens and dozens of stories of a great flood in the most diverse and disparate cultures, from the Japanese to the Maya, from the Babylonians to the Polynesians, from the Eskimos to the Aborigines of Australia and Africa? Noah's Ark is the story of a vast ecological catastrophe caused by human blindness. Do you think this may be a relevant story nowadays? I believe it could be the most compelling and urgent story for our time, and I hope you'll agree with me once we read it today. Just allow me to make a couple of preliminary notes before we start, because this is not a child's tale. Although we've seen all those beautiful cartoon depictions of Noah and the Ark and the little couples of animals marching along in order, etc., etc. This is not a children's story. This is a story of enormous consequence. Noah's Ark is also known as the story of the Great Flood. It's not a local adventure then that only affected one or two people. It's a disaster that befell the entire planet, or very nearly, drowning humans, birds, animals, reptiles, and plants. And this is part of its fascination, because it affirms and illustrates the intimate connection that twins all forms of life together. Ponder this. Human blindness and violence causes losses that first affect you and me as individuals. Someone is violent against us. We as individuals, are the first affected. But when you and I are affected as individuals, this will also affect our families. By affecting our families, they will start affecting our societies and then our nations and regions. And then with the same rippling effect we see when we throw a rock into a pond, the entire world. This is not an exaggeration. Somehow, Deep down, any personal loss ends up being a global loss, a little universal flood. What one person lost, we all lost. Ah, but also what one person wins, we all win. And this is the case with Noah, the captain of the ark. Whatever you and I do will inevitably affect others. Remember that beautiful, dazzling paradox from chaos theory that the flapping of the wings of a butterfly in the Amazon rainforest influences the exact formation time and trajectory that a tornado will follow weeks later on the other side of the planet. Ah, <sighs> our deeds as humans are more powerful than the wings of a butterfly. Imagine the influence we each have for good or ill on the rest of the planet. Millions and millions of innocent children are experiencing at this very moment while you listen to this the consequences of their parents' good or bad behavior, good or bad decisions. The virtues and the faults of the parents will bless or curse their children and then their children's children, and so on over generations, even though children are not guilty of the decisions made by their parents. Oh, what a cosmic responsibility we all have. For better or worse, if you and I fail, humanity is all the poorer. But what you and I accomplish is somehow an achievement for all mankind. As I said at the beginning, there are stories of a great flood in the most diverse and far-flung cultures of the earth. And what could be the message we should hear in this planetary choir? Well, to put it in today's scientific-sounding, but rather pagan terms, that our way of living, our lifestyle, can become unsustainable and cause an ecological imbalance which will drive nature, Mother Earth, Mother Nature, Gaia, 
to get rid of us, the problematic species, to restore balance in the planet. Do you think then that Noah's story may be a relevant story for our days? Let's listen and decide. God saw that human evil was out of control. People thought evil, imagined evil, 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 evil from morning to night. God was sorry that he had made the human race in the first place. It broke his heart. God said, I'll get rid of my ruined creation. Make a clean sweep. People, animals, snakes and bugs, birds, the works. I'm sorry I made them. But Noah was different. God liked what he saw in Noah. This is the story of Noah. Noah was a good man, a man of integrity in his community. Noah walked with God. As far as God was concerned, the earth had become a sewer. There was violence everywhere. God took one look and saw how bad it was, everyone corrupt and corrupting. Life itself corrupt to the core. God said to Noah, It's all over. It's the end of the human race. The violence is everywhere. I'm making a clean sweep. Build yourself a ship, an ark, from teak wood. Make rooms in it, coated with pitch, inside and out. I'm going to bring a flood on the earth that will destroy everything alive under heaven. Total destruction. But I'm going to establish a covenant with you. You'll board the ark, and your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives will come on board with you. You are also to take two of each living creature, a male and a female, on board the ship to preserve their lives with you. Two of every species of bird, mammal, and reptile. Two of everything so as to preserve their lives along with yours. Also get all the food you'll need and store it up for you and them. Noah did everything God commanded him to do. Next, God said to Noah, Now board the ark, you and all your family, out of everyone in this generation, you're the righteous one. Take on board with you seven pairs of every clean animal, a male and a female, one pair of every unclean animal, a male and a female and seven pairs of every kind of bird, a male and a female, to ensure their survival on earth. In just seven days, I will dump rain on earth for forty days and forty nights. I'll make a clean sweep of everything that I've made. Noah did everything God commanded him. Noah was six hundred years old when the flood waters covered the earth. Noah and his wife and sons and their wives boarded the ark to escape the flood. Clean and unclean animals, birds and all the crawling creatures came in pairs to Noah and to the ship, male and female, just as God had commanded Noah. In seven days, the flood waters came. It was the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, that it happened all. The underground springs erupted, and all the windows of heaven were thrown open. Rain poured for forty days and forty nights. That's the day Noah and his sons, accompanied by his wife and his sons' wives, boarded the ark and with them every kind of wild and domestic animal, right down to all the kinds of creatures that crawl and all kinds of birds and anything that flies. They came to Noah and to the ark in pairs, everything and anything that had the breath of life in it, male and female of every creature, came just as God had commanded Noah. Then God shut the door, behind him. 
The flood continued forty days, and the waters rose and lifted the ship high over the earth. The water kept rising. The flood deepened on the earth. The ark floated on the surface. The flood got worse until all the highest mountains were covered. The high water mark reached twenty feet above the crest of the mountains. Everything died. Anything that moved, dead. Birds, farm animals, wild animals, the entire teeming exuberance of life, dead. And all people, dead. Every living, breathing creature that lived on dry land died. He wiped out the whole works, people and animals, crawling creatures and flying birds, every last one of them gone. Only Noah and his company on the ark lived. The flood waters took over for 150 days. Then God turned his attention to Noah and all the wild animals and farm animals with him on the ark. God caused the wind to blow, and the flood waters began to go down. The underground springs were shut off, the windows of heaven closed, and the rain quit. Inch by inch, the water lowered. After 150 days, the worst was over. On the seventeenth day of the seventh month, the ship landed on the Ararat mountain range. The water kept going down until the tenth month. On the first day of the tenth month, the tops of the mountains came into view. After forty days, Noah opened the window that he had built into the ark. He sent out a raven. It flew back and forth, waiting for the flood waters to dry up. Then he sent a dove to check on the flood conditions, but it couldn't even find a place to perch. Water still covered the earth. Noah reached out and caught it, brought it back into the ark. He waited seven more days and sent out the dove again. It came back in the evening with a freshly picked olive leaf in its beak. No one knew that the flood was about finished. He waited another seven days and sent the dove out a third time. This time, it didn't come back. In the six hundred first year of Noah's life, on the first day of the first month, the flood had dried up. Noah opened the hatch of the ark and saw dry ground. By the twenty-seventh day of the second month, the earth was completely dry. God spoke to Noah, Leave the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives, and take all the animals with you, the whole menagerie of birds and mammals and crawling creatures, all that brimming prodigality of life, so they can reproduce and flourish on the earth. Noah disembarked with his sons and wife and his sons' wives. Then all the animals, crawling creatures, birds, every creature on the face of the earth left the ark family by family. Noah built an altar to God. He selected clean animals and birds from every species and offered them as burnt offerings on the altar. God smelled the sweet fragrance and thought to himself, I'll never again curse the ground because of people. I know they have this bent towards evil from an early age, but I'll never again kill off everything living as I just done. For as long as the earth lasts, planting and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never stop. God blessed Noah and his sons. He said, Prosper, reproduce, fill the earth. Every living creature, birds, animals, fish, will fall under your spell and be afraid of you. 
you're responsible for them. All living creatures are yours for food, just as I gave you the plants. Now I give you everything else, except for meat with its lifeblood still in it. Don't eat that. But your own lifeblood I will avenge. I will avenge it against both animals and other humans. Whoever sheds human blood, by humans let his blood be shed. Because God made humans in His image, reflecting God's very nature. You're here to bear fruit, reproduce, lavish life on the earth, live bountifully. Then God spoke to Noah and his sons. I'm setting up my covenant with you, including your children who will come after you along with everything alive around you, birds, farm animals, wild animals that came out of the ark with you. I'm setting up my covenant with you that never again will everything living be destroyed by flood waters. No, never again will a flood destroy the earth. God continued, This is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and everything living around you, and everyone living after you. I'm putting my rainbow in the clouds, a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. From now on, when I form a cloud over the earth and the rainbow appears in the cloud, I'll remember my covenant between me and you and everything living, that never again will flood waters destroy all life. When the rainbow appears in the cloud, I'll see it and remember the eternal covenant between God and everything living, every last living creature on earth. And God said, This rainbow is the sign of the covenant that I've set up between me and everything living on the earth. The story of Noah's Ark in chapters 6 to 9 of the book of Genesis, which we just read, concludes with a remarkable covenant between God and all the creatures of the earth. God publicly commits himself never to destroy the earth again. Simply breathtaking. God's mercy will never again depend on our response, on our good behavior. God will be merciful because He is merciful, not because we could ever earn His mercy. It's, and will always be, a gift. And it must be a gift because it's not something we could ever buy or win with our many merits. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> the biblical account of the flood is a milestone in the development of human thought, a quantum leap in our perception of God, who God is, and how He relates to us. A giant step towards a less violent, less arbitrary, more relational, loving, even intimate conception of God. This is so different from every other culture. In all the accounts of the flood from other cultures, and there are dozens of them all around the planet, as we said, the gods are angry at the wicked and deceitful ways of men, and they unleash the flood, and all the world dies, and the gods are then satisfied. Their sense of justice is vindicated. But the God of the Bible is different, and uniquely, the biblical account concludes with a covenant, a pact, a treaty, initiated by God himself. He did not have to promise anything to anyone because he owes nothing to anyone. And this is a covenant of peace because God wants to live in harmony with us, because God wants to preserve and restore life. 
God wants to relate to us, save us from the consequences of our blindness and violence, and humbly takes the initiative. God, imagine God takes the first step and seals his promise of peace by displaying an extraordinary rainbow in those very skies that have been covered by clouds and storm and thunder until now. This is why the rainbow became and will always remain a symbol of peace between God and all the creatures of the earth. <sighs> and here we must make an unavoidable parenthesis. LGBT activists have commandeered the rainbow to their cause in the last three years. We are never given the impression that they are seeking peace with God, are they? They have also seized the unicorn, which for millennia has been and will continue to be a symbol of virginity, of sexual purity. Do they mean to tell us by this that deep down they are indeed seeking peace with God, that they are longing for sexual purity? Amazingly, shockingly, that's exactly what they're doing, whether they know it or not. How can we assist them in their goal of finding peace with God and recovering their sexual purity? And I do not suggest this with any sarcasm. I belong to the school of thought that deep down we all are always seeking peace with God in everything we do, ugly or beautiful, good or bad, loud or quiet, because the hunger for God is encrypted in our DNA. As Blas Pascal said, we all carry in our hearts a gap in the form of God, which therefore only God can fill, no one else and nothing else. So we'll keep looking for God until we find him, no matter how far we go. Anyway, anyway. <clears throat> One immediate clue to the precious symbolism of the story of the flood is the use of the word ark in the title. Notice that we always speak of Noah's ark, not Noah's boat or Noah's vessel, or Noah's floating zoo. Although we could have excellent reasons to speak of a boat, a vessel, or a floating menagerie. We have always used the term ark to refer to this vessel in which humanity and the animals of the world are saved from the flood. Ark. Do you remember where else the Bible talks about an ark? Ah, of course, the Ark of the Covenant. Wow! The words Ark and Covenant appear together again. Remember that Noah's story begins with the building of an Ark and ends with a Covenant. Hmm, the most valuable portable object in the whole of Israel's and the Bible's history is the Ark of the Covenant. And what is an Ark? An urn, a chest, a container built to keep and protect what is most sacred. Like the shell, the tegument, the endocarp of a seed which is there to protect the embryo, the life hidden in the seed. So this magnificent story of Noah's Ark could well have been called Noah's shell. The shell around life, the protective layer around the embryo, the life hidden in the ark, in the seed. The ark is a seed. Isn't that a dazzling image? The flood is a cleansing, a process of planetary detox, 
a radical purification of the earth, a cataclysm that almost returned the planet to the primordial chaos. This is another capital detail. This is not the story of the universal fire, the universal earthquake, the universal hurricane. It's the universal flood. The active agent is water. And what does water do? Wash, clean, purify, and also nourish and awaken the life hiding in the seed. Life was palpitating within the shell, the ark that protected it. The ark was a small but prodigious seed floating in the water. Isn't this a beautiful story? God is just and merciful. For the sake of justice, he must punish human corruption with the flood. Humans should pay for the consequences of their acts. We all agree on that. But out of love for mercy, God preserves a remnant to give us one more chance so that a new beginning may be possible. Amid all the corruption and rot in our societies, God finds what is valuable, that which is not yet rotten, and saves it. God finds Noah and the animals of the world and hides them in a beautiful shell where they can survive the cataclysm. Oh, what a scintillating image of the way God cares for us. Why would there be many versions of this story of the flood in dozens and dozens of cultures around the world, in Africa, Asia, Mesopotamia, India, Alaska, and Latin America? Why is it that a story as peculiar and even strange as this one figures in the memory of so many cultures that never possibly had contact with each other? Well, against childish and poisonous comments like those of Richard Dawkins, Bill Nye, and other clever guys, it can only be because... One, there was indeed at some point a man like Noah, and his story was adopted by other cultures with slight variations as it spread throughout the world. Two, and much more interesting, if the flood is a literal event... There was a flood that covered all those civilizations. There was a Noah character in all those cultures that remember the story. Just imagine. God took care to find a man like Noah in each of those civilizations to preserve life everywhere. Wow. Or better yet, three. If the flood is a symbol, a metaphor, then God gave all the cultures of the earth this warning of the disasters we may unleash with our destructive deeds and habits. You choose. I love all three possibilities. This is such a beautiful and generous story in all three options. God is so beautiful and generous to us in all three possible versions of the facts. No matter how corrupt and violent a culture has become, God is going to save men and women like Noah from among them to give us yet another chance as individuals and civilizations. Oh, what grace it would be to strive to be the Noah character in our family, in our neighborhood, in our society. Not to save ourselves, but out of the yearning not to let ourselves be compromised or corrupted or distracted so that we are better able to save life around us. This would be a noble and glorious mission for anyone, don't you think? So let us all be Noahs in the midst of our societies and also in the most intimate and personal level. Your ark... Oh, you Noah listening to me, is your own body, mind, heart, and in it, 
throbbing. You carry the life that you have to protect and bring to bloom for the benefit of the whole world. You think that your life would be boring and gray and plain if you began to think and feel like Noah? If you began to realize that you are in an ark amid the storm and that it is up to you to protect life and help it flourish? Wouldn't you appreciate yourself more? Would you not respect yourself more? Would you not be in awe of yourself if you had before you this vision of being the Noah who protects the precious seed of life in the midst of the current ecological, spiritual, and moral catastrophe in the societies around us. This will be a catastrophe we created ourselves, and we cannot blame anyone for the flood that is already upon us. Life can only be saved by those like Noah who take responsibility for living a clean life, for picking up the trash and the broken plates, for the love of life, to save life and help it flourish. The flood is coming, and it threatens to bury all that is good if we give up. Let's not abandon the helm. It's a terrible job. According to the biblical account, Noah spent 120 years building the ark, trying all that time to alert his neighbors to the coming flood. But no one listened, and they all laughed at him for 120 years. And even once aboard the ark, Imagine Noah's loneliness and doubts as he opened the window in the ark every morning to see nothing but terrifying waves and winds and thunder all around him, day after day, week after week, without losing hope, without allowing himself be defeated, doing everything he had to do that day to keep the ark afloat and save his family and the animals that were entirely dependent on him. A flood can only do two things. Drown us or purify us. Bury us or transform us. Once the flood had purified the earth, God was able to establish a new covenant with all of us. And he signed it with the rainbow. Thanks for listening. May we all have the courage and character to be Noah's to save and protect life wherever we are. If you liked it, don't leave without giving me a like. And then share it and subscribe so we can stay in touch. <laughs>